Did I say good morning, church? I thought I forgot that. Let's continue our series on the fall out of Genesis chapter 3. Let me read again the first few verses of chapter 3. Just to remind us where we are. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious. Probably smelled good too, huh? And she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Let's pray. Father, we adore you for all the love that you've poured out on us in so many ways. And we thank you for this book that you've given us and for watching over it and keeping it accurate for us. We thank you for speaking to us through it. We thank you for the promises there. We thank you you reveal yourself through it. You tell us who Jesus is. Thank you that you, you have shown us your plan for us throughout eternity in it. Thank you you show us how to be saved in it. Thank you for the many blessings of the book that you've given us and watch out over. And we know from this book, your word today, you have some good stuff for us that will help, encourage us, lift us up, guide and direct, protect us, and even more. So we're asking you, do your work through your word, and by your Holy Spirit here with us today. And please anoint this teacher in the name of Jesus. And the believer said, Amen. Amen. Let's go down to verse 8. What happens next? Now remember, Adam and Eve, uh, Adam just ate from the fruit. And at that moment, they felt shame at their nakedness. And then they sewed fig leaves. They got down at Kohl's. <laughs> Just seeing if you're listening or not. <laughs> Verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard Yahweh God walking about in the garden. So they hid from Yahweh God among the trees. Now first shame hit them, remember? Shame hit them immediately. They spotted their nakedness. And now, what's it look like? What's hitting them now? Doesn't, and it looks like that, doesn't it? it? Looks like they're confronted with fear right away. When? When what? When did the fear hit them? When they heard the sound of God 
walking in the garden. Why did fear hit them when they heard God walking in the garden? Could it be that, that they thought that God would come to them and say, your sin demands attention? Is that a good thing, church? Does, uh, do our sins demand attention? And is God good enough to tell us about that? Amen. It is a good thing to realize and to know and accept that our sins demand attention. But why is it that still sometimes we try hiding our sins? Just like Adam and Eve hiding amongst the bushes when they heard God coming. Now, did you notice here? Now, of course, God knew ahead of time they'd messed up. He knew they'd disobeyed. He knew they'd eaten from that tree. And he needed to get their attention, right? But what he did not do was sneak around behind them, around the trees that they were hiding behind, and come up behind them and yell, Boo! You know, <laughs> to try to terrify them. Now, he did not do that in order to get their attention, did he? They, they were already fearful. Can you imagine how easy it had been for God just to terrify them at that moment? <clears throat> I got gotcha. you. Yeah. No. How did he approach them? They allowed, he allowed them to hear him walking in the garden first. In other words, he was reminding them of his presence. I'm still here in the garden. How many times do you think, probably at least daily, I don't know how long since the creation, uh, they've been uh, sinless, walking with, garden, with uh, God in the garden each day, hadn't had any kids yet. So it probably wasn't too long after the creation, is my guess, or they'd have started making babies already. Nonetheless, by this time they were still used to walking with God in the garden. Now I believe uh, this was actually Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus, showing himself in a human form so that they had, could have that kind of fellowship walking in the garden. I don't know that for sure, uh, but from the rest of Scripture, I'd say that's how God was presenting him, his, Himself with them. And did you notice that he, he came to them in the cool of the day, in the most comfortable time of the day? Now, God doesn't do anything by accident, does He? You know, He came to them like He did. And, and he picked that time of the day out on purpose. He had a gentle approach as he came to them after their sin, didn't he? Reminds me of Elijah. You remember the prophet Elijah? He's the one that had the big showdown with the, with the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth on the mountain. And uh, God proved that God was God there uh, by burning up Elijah's sacrifice. And then Elijah went and killed all those false prophets. And then Queen Jezebel. Ahab was king at the time in the northern tribes, and his wife was Jezebel. Anyone in here have a relative named Jezebel? They don't use that name. We don't use it, do we? Because she was evil. And, and she got the word out that she was going to uh, kill Elijah by the next day. And so Elijah ran. You remember that? Fear struck him. And he ran. And he told God, he says, I'm the only one left in Israel that's serving you. No sense. I'm giving up. No sense me carrying on. I'm the only one left. And he ran south into the wilderness. God spoke to him and told him, go to the mountain. And I believe it was the same mountain that... Uh, 
uh, Moses went to. And he climbed that mountain. And I can picture him. Now, this is my picture. I don't know what yours is, and I don't know for sure. I didn't get any picture sent to me of him there. But standing in front of a cave high up in the mountain. And God was going to speak to him. And, and God... God sent a storm, remember? A wind storm. And the wind, it says, was so strong, the wind was knocking the rocks off the side of the mountain, and they were tumbling down the side of the mountain. And the, and the scripture says, God didn't speak in the storm. And then there was a great earthquake, shook the whole mountain and shook rocks loose. Rocks again rolled down off of that mountain. But God didn't speak in the earthquake. And then God sent a fire across the mountain, roared, but God didn't speak in the fire. And then it got quiet. And the scripture tells us, God spoke in a still, small voice, in a soft, gentle voice. And that's how Elijah heard God speaking. And I believe the same thing was happening with Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. God was taking a gentle approach. Yes, he did have to address them, didn't he? But he had a gentle approach. Now, isn't that the way he normally comes to you? that he takes a gentle approach. And of course it helps if you'll get quiet, right? If you'll slow down, if you'll get in a pl quiet place with him so that you can hear his still, small, soft voice. And if you don't listen, God can get a little louder. Anyone notice that? In fact, if you keep ignoring what he's saying, he not only can get louder trying to speak to you, but he can start making things tough on you. Why? Because he wants to help you. I mean, after all, you just messed up. Adam and Eve had just sinned. They just disobeyed. They were in trouble. Remember what Satan's plan was. I'll, I'll get those two to sin, and then those, that sin will, will break the relationship between them and God. Satan knew that. So God didn't want that, so he approached them with a, with, in a gentle way, with a, with a soft voice. Why does he come that way? Because he loves you, right? He cares about you. He wants to convince you that the sin is dangerous. And it hurts not only your relationship with him, but your relationship with others when you sin. And he wants to humble you. Because when you're humble, that's when you realize you have a need that you can't meet yourself. And so you humble up and you go to God and say, I need your help. Please help me, Lord. So he wants to humble you so that he can help you. And he wants to restore you. That's why he comes. That's why he went to Adam and Eve. He didn't want that separation that the sin brought, that the disobedience bought, brought. He, wants, he wanted to restore them to right relationship with himself. He did not want to terrify them. God wanted to reveal Satan's motives there and what he was up to. And God wanted to show what his motives were. I just love you, Adam and Eve. And I want you to come to trust me again and rely upon me. Allow me to love you. Let's go to verses uh, 9 and 10 now. Then Yahweh God called to the man, Where are you? Why does it say he called to the man? Why did he call to the man? Remember from last week, God made man first. God told the man uh, what he could do and couldn't do. 
God gave him instructions on the dominion he was to have over the earth and the creation, the animals and all. He set him in charge, and then the man passed all that information to the woman. So because the man came first, the man has the greater responsibility. And he does right now, too, in the difficult situation. So God called out to him, Where are you? And he replied, the man replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Mm. Where are you, Adam? Where are you, Cindy? Where are you, Darren? Maybe he's saying that to you today. Where are you? Where are you in your relationship with God? I just had a brother in the church just came to me this week. He says, I need to re recommit my life to the Lord. He says, I'm having physical problems. He says, I'm having relational problems. So those I love, I've been blowing up on, getting angry. He said, I'm having some mental problems. I'm having struggles in my mind trying to handle everything that's going on and the pressures, the stress that I have in my life. And I don't seem to be getting the help from the Lord I used to get. And he told me, I need to recommit my life to the Lord. He took an honest look at himself where he was. And if you want to walk closer to Yahweh, then you've got to be honest with yourself. Where are you in your relationship with Him? You've got to be honest with yourself. You have realized by now that you deceive, we deceive ourselves, don't we? We give ourselves excuses, reasons. God, what, what's he doing with Adam right here? God is helping Adam to see himself. And he does that with you and I also. Because we're not always looking. Now what would have happened if God didn't come, if God didn't come seeking Adam out? I believe that if God hadn't been uh, seeking Adam, looking for Adam, what was Adam doing? He and Eve? Hiding, right? They're hiding from God. I believe scriptures make it clear that no man seeks God. Now some of you might have thought, yeah, I went on a God search, you know, to find God. But that isn't really what happened. Because as you grow in the Lord later on, you find out, I don't have that within me because of my sin nature. It was really God drawing me first. Or I wouldn't have come at all. So if God hadn't have gone after Adam, I believe Adam would have wandered aimlessly the rest of his life. No man seeks after God. God's got to go after him. He's got to come after us. He tackled you, didn't he? Somebody say amen. Thank you, Lord, that you did. And isn't that the point here? We thank the Lord that he did go after Adam and that he does come after us whenever we mess up. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> after all, Adam was... Spiritually naked, too, wasn't he? His physical nakedness was just a, a revelation of his spiritual nakedness. He no longer was wearing the righteousness of God because he sinned. The righteous, the glory of God. He, I bet Adam was glowing with the glory of God before the sin. And the righteousness, he was, it was gone. He's no longer right with God. No wonder why he was afraid, huh? That gives reason to fear when you're not right with God. 
then the scriptures in the New Testament, don't they tell us to put on Christ and His righteousness? Amen? Put on Christ. Draw near to Him with humble boldness. And yes, you can use both those two words side by side. Humble boldness. Amen. Verse 11. God's talking. Who told you that you were naked? Yahweh, God asked him, and I started thinking. I says, well, it wasn't the guy down the block that told him he was naked. There's only two people in the whole earth at this time, right? So why'd God ask such a question? Who told you you were naked? Why would he ask a question like that? Well, you know God, he's got a purpose here. God knows Adam, Adam's sin. So what's God after with this question? He wants Adam to confess his sin. Isn't that what he's after there, church? He wants him to confess his sin, and that's going to take humility. In other words, Adam's got to be able to spot his need for God right now. He's got to be able to realize, I'm not going... I'm not going to be in good shape on my own. I'm in trouble on my own. I need God. And God helps the humble, doesn't He? Did Adam confess the whole truth when God first questioned him in this incident at all? Did he confess the whole truth to God? Well, let's go back to verse 10. Take a look here. Did he? It says, uh, He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. What did he confess there? Only that he's naked, right? <clears throat> that didn't bother God any, did it? Did he confess his sin? Did he confess what he did wrong? No. You, you know, uh, we are like Adam, though. And that's, that's one reason we're spending some time in this section. We learn about ourselves, not just Satan and God here, but ourselves. Don't we sometimes tend to confess only what is known by others? Reminded me of uh, when I was a young man working at the Sio Pottery. One, one shift, that's back in the days where there was 15 or 1,600 people working there. And uh, one shift one day, I believe I was drawing the bisque kill. That's the, that's the kill that uh, makes the clay hard. Um, and the, so the pottery gets first hard. I, I was coming up on a break, and I had drawn my kill way back to where I had a little extra time. And so I had, uh, the pottery itself is a big plant, and there's a set of railroad tracks that goes right up the middle of the plant. So it's actually uh, the far side and the close side, two sides to the, to the plant. And I was on the far side, more where the, uh, the finishing stuff happens. And, uh, and so I had this, ex I knew a buddy of mine was working the same shift on the near side. And so I went over to see him, uh, my, my buddy Jim Voorhees. And uh, Jim was working uh, a press. Uh, in the presses where they'd put the wet clay in and then press the water out till they get the clay just the right uh, uh, density uh, to put in molds and where it could then be cooked and made hard. And so he's working at the presses and he had a little more freedom on that job. And so he and I did something we sh weren't supposed to do. We went to the silos out by the uh, main tracks, railroad tracks there. And there's, I think there's six silos there and there may be 70, 80 feet high, something like that, maybe higher. And in the silos, they're filled with clay, the dry clay, before it's mixed. And um, we climbed the ladder up the middle of the silos. 
uh, and and was went up way up high there, up above the whole valley, and was looking out over. We're just having a high old time at work, uh, up on the silos, and and after a while we we uh, decided we better get back to work. So I came down the the ladder first, just like a silo at a farm. If you've climbed the the ladders on a silo at a farm, I came down the ladder first and got almost to the bottom, and and Jim he starts down at the top, and he had a press knife in his back pocket, which is which is really a chisel, a chisel with a, a blade on it about that big, and it was thick and heavy, just like a chisel. He had that stick in his back pocket. He started to come down, knocked it out of his pocket. I had to be at least 50 feet below him, and that press knife came down and caught me right there. And I went, uh, I went, I was, I was uh, wobbling a bit, got down at the bottom, there's a high ceiling at the bottom, and every time my heart would pump, blood was being pumped all over the ceiling. Uh, and the, and, and uh, he got down pretty humble, he was, when he got down, looked at me, watched that blood, looked at that blood splashing around, pumping around, and uh, he said, we're going to have to tell somebody. Nobody's allowed up those silos. <laughs> We're going to have to tell somebody. So we found a shift foreman and uh, says, I got uh, injured. What are you doing on this side? He says, you're working on the other side. I says, I know I was wrong. He says, but I stood up under a press. <clears throat> And then he took us to the nurse who was who was uh, working the shift that day, and and uh, you know, but that's how that's how we are. We only tell as much of what we did wrong, as much as our of our sin, as others already know, as much as we have to. That's what Adam was doing too. And you see what he can get away with. Do I have to? But, but you know, God, you know, God. He's going to want to know all of it. He's going to want you and me and Adam to confess everything, isn't he? Isn't that how he is? For our good, so that he can help us. <clears throat> In fact, he won't quit until you've fessed up everything. Now the trouble comes in with when there's pride there. Because pride hinders help from God. Let's look at uh, James chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, uh, God gives grace generously. Oh, church, somebody needs to take this truth home with them today. It, just, it's, it doesn't say God just, just gives you a little bit of grace or shoves a little bit out to you in your time of need. Or, it says He gives His grace generously. You know what grace is? That's His help. Whatever kind of help you need, that's, that's grace. He gives it generously. More than you need. Do you believe that? Generously. He gives grace. Now the devil, he wants to lie to you and say, you didn't help me enough, God. Well, don't believe him. <laughs> As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud. Why? They're not asking for help. I'll make it through this. I'm a man. I've handled other things. Or they want to turn to a person instead of God. Pride hinders help from God. And so God opposes the proud. He won't force His help on somebody. You're praying for some, some of you are praying for some people that don't want any help from God. So first you've got to pray that He, that he uh, will change their hearts. That's what needs to happen. Instead of changing the circumstances of the trouble they're in, their pride won't allow them to cry out. Well, He opposes them, see. That's the truth. They need a heart change. But He gives grace to the humble, those who know they need help and are willing to cry out for it. Those are the ones He helps. It doesn't say he might help, it says he will help. And how much will he help? He will generously pour out his help. 
No matter what the sin, the mess, the mess up is, or whatever other area of need, <clears throat> he will help the humble. Verse 12, the man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Look at that verse again. Does he sound sorry? He doesn't, does he? Essentially, he's saying, it's not my fault. It's the woman's fault. And we guys know that that's generally true, right? <laughs> not, not. <laughs> Please forgive me, ladies, sisters. But that's what Adam was saying. It's the woman's fault. The woman you gave me. Isn't that how sin is and sinful people are when they're holding on to their sins? Sin shirks responsibility. Doesn't that sound like this generation that we're alive in right now? This culture that we're alive in right now? Shirking responsibilities left and right? No one wants to take responsibility for what they did wrong or... So they give excuses for their actions that were wrong or for their inactions that were wrong. Reminds me of being a kid. There was a, six kids in our family. And um, you know, if you grew up with any siblings, you might have had a fight with a sibling at one time or another. All right? <laughs> and if one of your parents caught you, caught you two fighting, then uh, the normal response given to the parent is what? You know, one of them's hitting the other one. Parent catches them. And what's the kid say? He was teasing me. He was laughing at me. What else could I do but hit him? Right? Or her. And if your mom was like my mom, my mom at a very young age told me, you do not hit girls. You will never lay a hand on a girl. Never. Never do that. And so my sister Gay knew that. <laughs> She's sitting right back there. <laughs> And so she would, she would come at me knowing I could not touch her. <laughs> Help me to be a preacher. <laughs> Thank you, Gay. <laughs> In other words, the siblings are saying, I had reason for it. I have an excuse. They deserved it. <clears throat> Adam, that was his excuse. It was the woman. They made me do it. She made me do it. But then that wasn't the only excuse he gave. Let's throw that scripture back up again. You see another excuse there? You see it? One more excuse. It was the woman you gave me, God. You gave me that woman. He's blaming God. Does he know what he's doing? Blaming God? It says, you allowed this, God. You made her like that. You could have made her differently. Or you could have interceded here. Why didn't you jump in and stop us? It's your fault too, God. You could have done something. <laughs> you ever blame God? When you sin, does God assist sins? No, of course not. It makes me think about our society right now. We've got people who, are, who have said and are saying, God made the marijuana plant, so it ought to be legal. We ought to legalize it, because He made it, right? God's behind this. But to us, we know that sin. Turn your mind over to control to something else, to another spirit, and it is a spirit. I've heard, I've had some guys say to me, God made grapes, and He knew we'd make wine out of it, so it must be His will that I drink wine and I drink alcohol. God made what we make the alcohol out of. Or someone else might say, blaming it on God, 
He gave me those parents. God's the one that gave me those siblings. And they're the ones raised me to be like this. And blame it on God. <clears throat> Verse 13, Then Yahweh God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Does that sound familiar? She's acting just like her husband, isn't she? Is, is she confessing? No. She's got the same responses as Adam. She is giving excuses. Blaming it on Satan. Blaming it on someone else. And that's again, that's that old sin nature. We want to blame things on someone else. I, I was thinking about this and I, I thought we ought to be humiliated when we allow a known cheat, a known liar, a known swindler, our sworn enemy, Satan, to trick us into sinning. That ought to humiliate us that we allowed him to do that. Pulled one over on us. I can remember I was a freshman in college, my first quarter there. I wasn't saved, and so, you know, kids are, when, as soon as they hit the campus, me and, a, me and a, a guy I met, new friend, we headed for one of the, uh, a campus bar, and uh, I'm 17 years old, and um, I probably, I'm sure I looked at and we got in there and found a seat and some guy in a long black trench coat came over sat down beside me and he and he pulled up his arm sleeve way up and it was covered with watches <laughs> and he says i got a tremendous deal on a bunch of watches he says and and uh, so i'll sell you one and look at the names on these watches. You know, these are, these have got the big names on them. Then he opened up his coat. And why is he wearing his big black trench coat? Opens up his coat. He's got watches all the way down through here. Opens up the other side. And he says, do you like this one? Do you like this one? And I said, uh, so I'm looking at all his watches. I pick one out I like. And he says, cheap. He said, I'll sell that to you cheap. I forget what it was. Now it couldn't have been more than five bucks. <clears throat> So I wore that thing for about two weeks before it died. Yeah, it looked good, but it died. And I thought, what a fool I was. I did not realize this swindler, this trickster, had, was pulling one over on me, and I felt embarrassed and humiliated to even tell somebody else that I was tricked and fooled. And when Satan tricks and fools us, we ought to be feeling the same way. Embarrassed and humiliated that he pulled one over on us. Because what we're saying is, we allowed him to control us. To do what he wanted us to do. That's humiliating. Our sworn enemy... Allowing him to control us. And also we tend to avoid taking responsibility when we do get fooled, don't we? It was my fault. No, nope, nope, I'm ready to give excuses. I'm a neophyte on campus. I'm a young guy. I'm not used to... That's all right. If you've got a brain and you've got the Lord, then he'll show you where are the enemies at work. <clears throat> we can't mess up in that way. But when we do mess up, and we do, somebody say amen. amen. We have a merciful God. Merciful. Let's look at uh, Psalm 32, verse 5. I'll give you a verse to take home and, and put on your refrigerator. When we do mess up, we go to him and he will be merciful. 
Mercy is when God treats us or somebody else treats us well when what we deserve is punishment. That's what mercy is. We get treated well when we didn't deserve it at all. And that's what God does for us all the time. That's what you can count on. You don't earn anything from God, do you, brothers and sisters? There's nothing you can earn from Him. You're going to earn your way into heaven? You're going to earn blessings from God? No, everything He gives us is because of His mercy. And because of that mercy, we don't deserve it, and we deserve otherwise. Then He pours, what's it, what did it say? Generous blessings upon us. Generous grace on us. In fact, I've got two scriptures I've been using in prayer for years. I'll probably use them uh, forever. Uh, one of them is one of the Psalms that says, where God says, my, my mercy is new every day. So you think you used up all of His mercy yesterday. But then He's got a new batch of mercy for, you to, for, for Him to pour out on you the, ne the next day. Another scripture says, God says, My mercy is higher than the heavens. So it doesn't matter how much mercy of God you've been using up and He's been pouring out on you. He's still got a lot more to pour your way and that's His plan and you can count on it. He will pour out mercy to you if you'll go to Him every time you mess up. Hallelujah. And that you can count on. Let's look at our verse here. This is King David. Did King David mess up any? He broke all ten commandments. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you. And when uh, this you right here with a capital Y is referring to who? God. Amen. And stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to Yahweh, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. I don't know about you, but I don't like carrying a lot of guilt around. That's no fun, is it? The weight on your conscience, on your soul, from the guilt of some sin, some ungodly way you were acting, or, or way you should have been acting. That's no fun to carry around. This God is promising us here that if in humility we will go to Him and ask for help when we mess up, He promises to do what? To forgive, doesn't He? To forgive and lift that load of guilt off of you and set you free to go high-stepping for Jesus again. Amen. I confessed all my sins. I stopped trying to hide. I quit giving my excuses. And I'm not running from God and trying to hide my sins from Him. That's what David said. Thank you, Lord. Let's stop right there today. And we'll uh, see next week, what are we looking at? Verse 14, Then Yahweh God said to the serpent, That sounds interesting, doesn't it? Now you and I probably realize we are, we are like Adam and Eve. In fact, we've inherited that same nature, the sin nature. We've inherited that. We, caught, we were born with that disease. And so these same tendencies we, we have. Now what's God saying to you today? What's He saying to me? Is He asking anyone here, are you hiding from some sins from me? Are you trying to hide from me? Like Adam and Eve were in the garden? Are you giving excuses for some of the sins that you've committed? Have you gone to God yet asking for that mercy, knowing you'll get it? Have you humbled up? Do you want to be right with God? Do you have sins that you're hiding or giving excuses for? Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, there may be some areas in our lives that we've just been ignoring. Some ungodly areas that we need to bring to You. We've committed some sins, Lord. We 
want to bring them all to you. We want that mercy. We want the freedom of having no guilt. We don't want anything become, coming between us and you. If you'll just confess those to the Lord today. Confess those sins. Get your freedom back. Get to the place where you can hear God's soft, gentle voice again. So that He can speak to you and generously pour out grace and help of all kinds. Don't let the devil pull one over on you. Remember this time of the service every day. Um, if you have needs, you come to these altars here. Come to this side if you just want to pray alone with God. And if you come to this side, uh, then you're telling, telling me or someone that you'd like uh, someone to pray with you. Responding to God and what He's saying is crucial. Let's go to the prayer tablet. Then. Here we have a praise that a 52-year-old man who has had heart blockage has been praying and the latest heart cath showed no more blockage. We know, Lord, that's you. And so we give you the praise and the glory. Uh, Will Beaver's nephew, Chris, 31 years old, has been diagnosed with severe diabetes and is, 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 is in much pain. And he says he doesn't think the Lord hears him. Father, if he's not hearing you, then there must be something between the devil must be getting his way. Help lead Chris to the place where there's no sin between him and you, where he can hear your voice. Help him, Lord. Show him you love him and show him your power. We continue to lift up the Wenger family and ask for peace and comfort as they continue to suffer in the loss of Chuck's dad. But also we rejoice with them knowing knowing where he's going to be with you. He put his faith in you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we continue to pray for those in the military from our church family. Protect them from the enemy, physically and spiritually. We want to lift up the, those in the military uh, all across our nation. Uh, we ask you, Lord, to keep them strong. Uh, we ask you to uh, use them to bless others, uh, to witness for Jesus. We just lift them to you today. And we also want to lift to you the persecuted church family that we have all over the world. Some of them are going to be killed today. Some of the women in our family, your family, Lord, somewhere are going to be raped today. Somewhere the kids are going to be taken away from families. And Lord, we know that Somewhere, some uh, homes are going to be burnt down. Shacks will be burnt down. Churches will be burnt down. Oh, Father, we lift up our persecuted brothers and sisters all over the world. Help them to be strong and to stay, uh, stay with you and depend on you. Lord, they haven't denied you, and we pray you'd continue uh, to keep them as yours. Give them wisdom. Uh, to, to um, know what to do and what not to do and to when to do things. Know who they can witness to and, and, uh, and when and how. We ask your blessings upon them today. And now, Father, I ask you to hear uh, the whispered prayers of my brothers and sisters as they give you their burdens.
lift all these prayers to you in the name of Jesus. And the believers said, please stand.